Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packer and welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we go through the writings of the church. And um, we are now going through the encyclical Ut Unum Sint, which means that they may be one. This was a 1995 encyclical from Pope St. John Paul II. And he's dealing with the church's commitment to ecumenism. Uh, of course, you can still download a free electronic copy of Ut Unum Sint or any of the other encyclicals going back to the 1700s by going to our document library at our website, EWTN.com. When you go to EWTN.com, you'll see libraries. Go to document library, type in Ut Unum Sint under encyclicals. But also, I urge you to look through some of the other encyclicals and see all kinds of things there. Now, of course, we love to have you involved and participate in our show. Uh, one option is to come right here to beautiful Irondale, Alabama, next door to Birmingham. Um, we have folks who've come from, uh, we have a few refugees, as we always do, every Fat Tuesday. We have uh, refugees from New Orleans who are getting away from Mardi Gras. Where all the Yankees go down there to take part in the mystery of it all. Um, and we also have folks all the way from London, England. They win the Long Distance Award, and we'd love to have you come and join us as well. Another option is to send us a question by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. And we'll try to get to your questions. Or you can also call us during the live broadcast, which is on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. If you're in North America, you can call 1-800-221-9422. Or if you are outside North America, you can call 205-271-2980. And if you are calling from a great distance, we'll try to put you at the head of the line so you don't have to wait overly long. All right, uh, we are continuing, getting close to the end of this document and also this series, as we'll talk a little bit later on. Um, we are in paragraph 99 of the encyclical Ut Unum Sint. And here, the, you know, we've been talking about the papacy in, uh, as an ecumenical issue. Um, folks from uh, Great Britain would know that a lot of the objection to, of a lot of non-Catholics to the Catholic faith comes from the papacy because the Church of England split from the uh, Roman Catholic Church because the papal dis disagreements with King Henry VIII uh, uh, continued on by his son Edward and certainly exacerbated by his daughter Elizabeth I. So that some of that was fairly bitter. Um, but he's been saying how important the issue of the papacy is because it's in Scripture. And the successor of Peter is not just about politics, it's, also, it's more importantly about the issue of the uh, gift of papacy that Jesus our Lord gave in St. Peter, and he changed his name. But also, you know, I, and I was talking to somebody yesterday, there was a man from Holland sitting next to me on the plane, and I don't speak Dutch, but we both spoke enough German that we could talk. And, you know, he was fascinated with the large number of denominations that we have in this country. I think the IRS says it's about 45,000 uh, you know, different groups, a lot of which are non-denominational denominations. And sometimes, sometimes the issue is, and this is what we were discussing, is that every pastor wants to be his own pope. And what we have to keep in mind is that one pope is enough. Uh, some churches thought it was too much, but they ended up starting their own. There, every pastor became pope. Um, so, <laughs> one of the gifts of the role of the successor of Peter is to limit how many popes you end up with, so that not everybody starts off their own thing and splits away. Um, 
But the Pope St. John Paul says here in paragraph 99 that as Bishop of Rome, he has this ecumenical task. And when he spoke to the cardinals and the Roman Curia in June of 1985, not long before this encyclical came out, he said, I quote, I would repeat that it is with an irrevocable decision of the Catholic Church that it became involved in the ecumenical movement and that she wishes to contribute to it in every way she can. As Bishop of Rome, I consider it one of my pastoral priorities. That this is one of the key things that he saw himself doing is an ecumenical uh, uh, priority, a pastoral priority, to be engaged in seeking the unity of the church. And that would include all the different churches. You know, that, uh, we, that's something that he saw as a uh, top priority. And he didn't start that. Uh, I was doing some other work. Um, I gave, recently gave a retreat to priests from Tyler Diocese in Texas. Great group of priests. I really enjoyed that very much. Um, you remember uh, Thanksgiving, we had the Bishop of Tyler on uh, EW10 Live. And the, um, one of the topics I was looking at is the origin of the phrase, uh, and the use of the phrase, the origin of the phrases in Scripture, that the priest acts in the person of Christ, in persona Christi. And that comes from St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10, when he says that he acts in to prosopo Christu, in the person of Christ. But I wanted to see how it was used in the fathers of the church, like St. John Chrysostom, uh, in regard to priests, and also in some of the councils. And that, you know, you could see in councils like the Fourth Lateran Council and the Council of Florence, that back then, in the 13th and uh, 15th centuries, the, and earlier and since, the popes, and councils were very concerned about unity in the church. Those councils were meant to help the uh, churches of the Eastern Orthodox and of the Catholics come back together. That's what they were trying to do. They, and they, they were able to meet with them sometimes, sometimes uh, obviously it didn't work out always so well, but they sought that because it's a priority from Christ. And Pope St. John Paul is seeing himself as continuing on that line, that we are here to seek the unity Jesus Christ, the high priest, prayed for in John 17. He says, I think the grave obstacle which the lack of unity in the church represents for, uh, for the proclamation of the gospel. Other people see, well, uh, and I had this recently, uh, this part of a phenomenon going on in the world, that lots and lots of Muslims are receiving dreams and visions around the world. It's amazing. And it's Christ appearing to them, or the Blessed Virgin Mary appearing to them. And they are being told to become Christians, and they do, even at grave risk in some cases. But they do, because they sense that God is the one who's calling them to become Christians. But the problem this one man had who spoke to me was, which priest do I go to? He thought all ministers and priests are the same. Where, where do I go? And the lack of unity among Christians is a scandal. Now, you know, Islam itself has lots of divisions within it, not only the big division between the Shia and the Sunni, but even those two major divisions have subgroups, the Ismaili and the Alwai, Alwi, the Alawites, and a variety of other groups. So there are divisions, but, you know, the, the, we can't, they have to deal with that 
division within Islam themselves. We have this division among Christians that needs great healing. And this is something very important for the preaching of the gospel and to help with clarity. A Christian community which believes in Christ and desires with gospel fervor the salvation of mankind can hardly be closed to the promptings of the Holy Spirit who leads all Christians toward full and visible unity. Now, this is one of the things that we have to keep in mind for ourselves, that we are very much in need of gospel fervor. One of the problems sometimes by which people don't really care about unity, well, you have your way and I have mine, that is the risk of indifferentism. Now, we've talked about that in the past, but indifferentism is an attitude by which people say, well, it doesn't matter, it's all one God, it's all the same, and just different spokes to the same center, and this kind of superficial notion of unity. That's not what we seek. Um, it's rather that we understand more and more deeply the world needs redemption. Do we see that everything is full of happiness, lollipops and roses every day? I don't think so. Even in places that are extremely wealthy, you know, having a lot of money does not make people happy. It doesn't. Look at United States of America, the richest country in the history of the world. No pharaoh of Egypt ever had a, as much luxury as a middle class person does. The best that pharaoh could hope for was somebody with a big fan. We have air conditioning. They could hope that somebody's going to bring logs for the fire in winter. We have central heating. And it's not a sooty. And this is something that is, you know, uh, uh, just absolutely fantastic. Sure, we may not have all the gold and jewels of Pharaoh, but it's a lot more comfortable. You can't eat those. They don't keep you warm, and they just make you nervous because somebody else always wants to steal them, as happened to all the gold and jewels of all the Pharaohs except King Tut, Tutankhamun. Uh, <laughs> it's because they couldn't find it. Otherwise, when they did find anything, they stole it. And when they found his, they put it in a museum where people still try to steal it. But in terms of comfort and delicious food and all this, we are way better off than the richest pharaohs. And, uh, and even the emperor of Rome had to stop eating some of the rich food and just go to stewed figs because of his digestion problem. Can't eat all that rich food that they had. So, you know, we do extremely well. And yet, despite all this wonderful wealth, are we happy? Do we find, oh, our politicians, just because they're so comfortable and rich. By the way, are there, is there more than one? I think there's one senator who is not a millionaire or more, a multimillionaire. And lots and lots of the folks in the House of Representatives are multimillionaires. Um, Nancy Pelosi is a multi-multimillionaire, many others. Does that make them at peace and calm because they have so much? Or don't they become viciously angry? Now, if you see the kind of anger and venom that goes on with all these rich people. And you look at the people on CNN and Fox and MSNBC and all these, those people are also extremely rich. They make millions of dollars. And are they at peace and happy? Or are they always sounding like the Nargul's from um, the, the Lord of the Rings? <coughs> you know, they say these people are so upset all the time. Bless their hearts, but they are having money and comfort doesn't bring you peace. It doesn't bring you joy. 
and we see lying, deceit, um, sometimes violence from these very rich people. Even our poor. Yeah, sure, there are people who are very poor in our country. But when you compare our poor to people in third world countries, you actually see that they live like the middle class in many of the third world countries. I, I, I've been to uh, a number of them in Latin America and Africa and Asia and, you know, and Eastern Europe before communism fell. And our people on welfare were better off than the middle class in most of those places. Does that make our people then more comfortable and relaxed? Or are they living deadly lives because of drug abuse, etc.? It's important to think about these things, because, especially as we start Lent. Because what we're dealing with is the reality of sin in the world. And we need to have, as the Pope says here, a gospel fervor for the salvation of the human race. What are people doing to themselves? And I could describe lots of other places. I just saw a report in the news today that um, when they were at the, uh, uh, the, the Congress you know, from our uh, intelligence agencies, they said there are more refugees due to war today than any time except after World War II. That's how bad the refugee situation is. Why is it so bad? Because so many people are vying with violence to destroy other people's lives. And little people are the ones who are the main victims. Folks who never started it, didn't have anything to do with it, are being shoved all over the world. And usually for dumb ideas usually nationalistic and racist ideas. Those are the dominant, not religion, sometimes religion, but mostly it's racist and ideological reasons. We have to have this kind of fervor for their salvation so that they live with, at peace with God, whether they're rich or poor, whether they're in uh, Christian countries or non-Christian, no faith at all. And we cannot be close to the promptings of the Holy Spirit to move us to be able to seek that unity so that our fervor for the gospel leads us to unity rather than saying it doesn't matter. See, that's not unity. That is giving up. When you just say, oh, no, it doesn't matter, it's all the same. No, you are intellectually lazy, if not worse. You know, spiritually lazy and perhaps morally lazy. That it doesn't matter. It does matter as to whether something is true or not about Christ and the Gospels. And let the Holy Spirit prompt all of us Christians to seek not to get our way, but to let the Holy Spirit conform us to His truth. Is he not called by Jesus our Lord the spirit of truth? Is that not what he himself teaches? So also we have to do that so that the Holy Spirit will lead us into all truth, as Jesus said. And that includes, based on what Jesus taught, that he will lead all Christians toward full and visible unity. Because Jesus taught us that they will know the love that the Father has by the unity among the Christians. That this unity shows the opposite. This is an imperative of charity. That's what's at issue. That charity is not complacency. Oh, it's okay, you do your thing, I'll do mine. That's, that's complacency, not charity. And we are called to this imperative of charity, an imperative that admits of no exception, that all of us are called to a unity in the truth of Christ. Ecumenism is not only an internal issue of the Christian communities, 
that it's not just something where we're turning inside and, and dealing with it. It is a matter of the love which God has in Jesus Christ for all humanity. That's the goal of our unity, to reach the whole human race, which is in great difficulty and trouble. To stand in the way of this love is an offense against God. If we, and again, He loves us enough to demonstrate the kind of unity that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit possess within the Trinity. Because what does Jesus our Lord say? Father, may they be one as the United Nations is one? No. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Um, uh, no, may they be one as you and I are one. That's the prayer of Jesus Christ, that we would have a unity that is like the unity of Jesus Christ and his Father, which is a unity in the Holy Spirit. He is the love between them that forms that unity. And that unity is the model for us to have unity, but also, as we've said throughout this whole encyclical, it is also a gift of God's grace, the power of the Holy Spirit, who makes that possible. That's why he said here that we cannot be closed to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who will bring that unity about in a way far beyond any mere human efforts. So that's very important. And it is also, to stand in the way of that unity, is also an offense against God's plan to gather all people in Christ. This is, uh, again, God's goal. It goes back all the way to Abram. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when the Lord God called Abram, a 75-year-old man, the purpose of the call was, uh, I'll make you a blessing for your family, but you will become a blessing for all the families of the earth. This was not just about Abram and his descendants but rather was oriented towards the whole of humanity. His vocation comes, and that's a very important thing to understand for, for understanding the Bible. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are the story of sin, especially from chapter 3, with Adam and Eve, and Cain and Abel, and then Abel's descendants, and then the flood, and all the, and the, the Tower of Babel. It's just this downward spiral of sin. And it's only when God breaks into that downward spiral, that history of sin, by calling Abram so that he would become a blessing to all of the families of the earth. This is the beginning point, the turning point, in which God begins to undo, step by step, very slowly through history. Because this was 1850 B.C. or so, and it's going to take a long time before Jesus Christ is uh, conceived. But, you know, in that process, it's the beginning of, uh, the, the transformation of the human race and that everyone who curses Abram and his descendants gets cursed and whoever blesses Abram and his descendants gets blessed. And later on, as a people, they will become a kingdom of priests. Why? Because they are meant to offer sacrifice for the sake of the whole world. Eventually, Solomon will build a temple for them to worship and offer sacrifice, but also so that anybody in the world who comes there to pray, the Lord would listen to. Read First uh, Kings chapter 8 and Solomon's prayer. See how the prophet Isaiah later on says that I will make my house a house of prayer for all nations. It's a sign that we put out here in front of EWTN since the, the, the days the sister built the, sisters built the convent and the chapel. 
you know, this is the goal, the conversion of the whole world, to, so that we all worship God with our whole hearts, minds, and souls. That's what Jesus Christ taught us. In blessed Pope Paul VI, uh, one time uh, wrote, or wrote to the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, Patriarch Athenagoras, back in January of 1970, where he said, May the Holy Spirit guide us along the way of reconciliation so that the unity of our churches may become an ever more radiant sign of hope and consolation for all mankind. So that this is, uh, you know, back, you know, remember Pope Paul VI met with the ecumenical patriarch back in around 1963 or so, I think it was. They met the uh, uh, first time in many centuries, I think first time since the uh, 1439. That's a big gap. And that was an important move, and they've been meeting regularly. The popes and the patriarchs have met regularly. Pope Francis uh, met with the ecumenical patriarch in Jerusalem as a place that we hold in common our faith, that this is where Christ died and Christ rose from the dead and Christ ascended into heaven. And they walked together and, and talked and, sh and had a, a good fellowship because they seek that kind of unity. But again, as we know from history, you can't just have the leaders agree amongst themselves. We also need, as we've said throughout this whole encyclical, the Holy Spirit to be prompting every one of us without exception. That's why he, he said in this paragraph that the imperative admits of no exceptions. All of us have to seek it. The laity, the clergy, the religious, the monks, the, and as well as popes and patriarchs. That all of us have to allow the Holy Spirit to stir within our hearts that desire <clears throat> and openness to the unity for which Jesus Christ prayed at the Last Supper. And this needs to be very much on our hearts and minds. Um, and I think that that's key. Now, I think we'll take a break there and we'll continue next week with his exhortation you know, at the end of this encyclical. I want to take a break now. We'll come back in a couple of minutes and get questions from our studio audience as well as from you and your emails. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Welcome back. I just want to make an announcement. We're going to start making this announcement on a regular basis that we're coming to the end of Threshold of Hope. Um, at the end of this month, we will not have Threshold of Hope, but that doesn't mean they've gotten rid of me. Ha! <laughs> no, no, I always explain to people that I'm sort of like a bull weevil. Once you let me in your cotton field, it's hard to get rid of me. But at any rate, um, at, uh, next month, in, at beginning in March, we'll certainly be doing our show live still. And it'll be at the same time slot as Threshold of Hope was. It'll be on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. But it will be a new show that I'm going to be doing and hosting. And it's a show that you, the viewers, have been asking for. Namely, I'll be hosting a live Bible study. And the show is going to be called Scripture and Tradition 
With who? Father Mitch Pack. All right, this is trouble. Uh, yes, but it'll be called Scripture and Tradition with Father Mitch Pack. Well, they should leave me out of it. Just keep calling it Scripture and Tradition. But I don't make those decisions. I just do what they tell me sometimes. And we hope that you'll tune in and participate in these Bible studies. Uh, we'll be, of course, in the season of Lent but next month. As a matter of fact, it starts tomorrow, but we'll wait until March to start this new uh, series. And we'll be looking into the scriptures at the beginning for questions like, what is sin? I'm going to talk about why it happened. How do we overcome our sin and the tendency to do it? the temptations we have. And in addition to the scriptures themselves, so make sure you have your Bibles. You know, one of the other tools we'll be using in Lent is uh, the, a book that I wrote a few years ago. It's called Winning the Battle Against Sin. Hope-filled lessons from the Bible. So winning the battle against sin. Now that wasn't my original title. That's what I was going to, no, I was going to call it sin. I'm against it, but sometimes I forget. That would have been very appropriate for me. But at any rate, these nicer people came up with the title, Winning the Battle Against Sin. And they're the publishers, so I just do what they say. You can get this book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. It is item 2250. Item 2250 at Catalog. You can either go online to EWTNRC.com or you can call them anytime. 1-800-854-6316. Okay, so that's what we'll do. All right, let us start off with Jane. Jane, where are you calling from? Uh, Oklahoma. Oh, what part? Uh, Chickasha. Oh, is that east or west? I don't know that part. Well, it's um, 50 miles south of Oklahoma City. Okay, so it'd be sort of more western Oklahoma. Yes. Yes, okay, that's not too far from the panhandle of Texas, right? That's right. Yeah, 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 okay. I have to get out that way one of these days. Anyway, what can we do for you this fine day? Well, I was uh, calling and I said that I have a good friend who is a um, member of the, um, well, I can't think what the name of the church is. Yeah. Um, the, the girl I talked with, she said she told me. Is it like Jehovah Witness or something? It's something like that. Okay. Jehovah Witness, yes. Yeah, that's okay. It. All right, and, Jehovah's uh, Witnesses. She was telling me that uh, we shouldn't, she doesn't think that Easter should be celebrated when Catholics celebrate it. I'm sure she doesn't. And she, she said that it's because, uh, oh, in, some, in, in one of the old, old Testament books, it says something about Easter. And do you know what I'm... Yeah, yeah. So, so what, here's what they do. They, they have sort of a funny way of celebrating it. Um, first of all, they celebrate uh, good, they sort of celebrate Good Friday uh, and on the first day of Passover by the Jewish calendar. I, uh, that's probably what she's referring to. That they, and so, uh, and this was something that was a tension in the early church, in the, uh, and all the way up to the uh, second century. That uh, and, and here is the tension. Should we celebrate with the Jewish counting of Passover, which meant that Easter would be celebrated on different days of the week every year? Because the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar. And the lunar calendar uh, is not as regular as a solar calendar. So uh, we, we have a solar calendar, right? 365.28 days a year. And we make up for that every four years, because it's not quite even, is it? So every four years we have a leap year. And it's still not quite right, so that uh, every century, the first year of a century, 
then they don't celebrate leap year. Actually, the, the last year of the previous century. So like in 1900 and 2000 and so on, uh, they don't celebrate leap year. And that keeps it very accurate. It's very precise, isn't it? And it was something that was uh, developed. And this is going to make it uh, add to her fuel to her fire. She'll get really mad about this. But the calendar is called the Gregorian calendar because it's named after Pope Gregory, who's probably, as far as she's concerned, an antichrist, like all the popes were. They, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like the papacy. And even worse, even worse, it was Jesuit astronomers who came up with the calendar. He happened to be pope, and they named it after him. But it was Jesuit astronomers who made it very precise, using the calculations of Copernicus and Kepler and others to, to make sure they got a real precise analysis of the uh, orbit of the Earth around the sun and the year. While the Jewish calendar doesn't focus on the sun, the, the relationship of the Earth to the sun, but it focuses on the moon cycles. So most years there are 12 months, but sometimes because the lunar cycle is only uh, 28 days, some years they have 13 months. Because at the end of a, a, a month, every so often. So the Jehovah's Witnesses celebrate on the 14th of Nisan by the Jewish calendar. That's what she's talking about. Whereas the um, Christians you know, came to eventually to an agreement that Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. He was crucified on a Friday. He rested in the tomb on the Sabbath, the Sabbath of the old creation. Remember in, in Genesis that the seventh day was, was Saturday, and that's the Sabbath. And that's part of the old creation. But Christ rose from the dead on Sunday, beginning a new creation. And so in the early church, they would celebrate every Sunday. You can read, for instance, St. Justin Martyr and others. And they would celebrate every Sunday as a mini celebration of Easter. And when they did celebrate Easter, they would celebrate it after the first full moon, after the spring equinox, the first Sunday after the first full moon, after the spring equinox. And that's why Easter changes every year. That's why this year, for the first time in my life, uh, Ash Wednesday is on Valentine's Day. I don't ever remember being on Valentine's Day. Or maybe when I was so young, I wasn't into doing Valentine's yet. Um, but I think it's the first time that in my lifetime, any of you remember Valentine's Day being Ash Wednesday? No. So this is the um, uh, first time since, what, 1945? See, it is. That's before my lifetime. Not a lot much, <laughs> but uh, first time since 1945. And it'll change. Sometimes Easter will be in late, uh, you know, uh, closer to the middle of April, sometimes at the beginning of April, and so on. Uh, because the vernal equinox is uh, March 20th or 21st, so it has to be the first full moon after that equinox and the first Sunday after the full moon. That way we combine that sense of celebrating Sunday as the day of the resurrection of Jesus. And we emphasize that more than letting the Jewish calendar determine what day we worship. You see, that's, that's the tension that they're dealing with. They're saying, well, we want to be authentic. Well, we want to celebrate, you know, what the Jewish people do. But then, just to toss off something else about what they do, they don't have sacraments in the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have what they call tokens. And they have the token of something like the Lord. They don't, I don't think they call it the Lord's Supper. They do that once a year on the 14th of Nisan in the Jewish calendar. And they have water and bread. 
And that's what they have as the tokens instead of bread and wine. And they have those and they pass them up and down the congregation. I would urge you, ask your friend that on the 14th of Nisan, when they have the tokens and they pass that around the church, has she ever partaken of the sacrament or token, again, use their word, uh, has she ever partaken of it? And the answer will be no. You know how I know? Only Jehovah's Witnesses ba uh, who were baptized by 1935 are eligible to receive the tokens. If you were baptized a uh, Jehovah's Witness after 1935, you are not permitted to receive. Now, there may be somebody who was baptized as a small child in 1935. That's possible. But there aren't many of them around, and every year it gets less and less. And so, because I think they can baptize at uh, age seven or so, um, uh, not much younger than that. And so, that group is less and less. Now, maybe she was one of them baptized before 1935, but hardly any are. And most congregations, they pass it up and down, and nobody can receive the tokens. Ask her about that, if she ever receives the tokens, and ask her why not. And then, in terms of her church being authentic to the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's Jesus Christ who at right before a Jewish Passover, the second Passover mentioned in the Gospel of John. That's in John chapter 6. And that's when he multiplies loaves and fish. And then he teaches about the Eucharist. And then he says about the Eucharist, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. Now, if your Jehovah's Witness organization, they don't call it a church, they call it the Jehovah's Organization. If your Jehovah's Witnesses organization does not permit anybody to receive even these tokens of water and bread, which for us is a sign of fasting, not of Eucharistic joy. But if you don't even let that, and Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you cannot have eternal life. Then how does your friend expect to ever receive eternal life if her church does not permit her or anybody else in the congregation hardly to receive the tokens? If that is forbidden by the church, is not their organization preventing people from receiving what Jesus Christ taught is necessary for eternal life. Just might be a question you want to ask her. We have a question here from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from London. London UK. in England. Well, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Oh, I hope everything is all forgiven after all these centuries. <laughs> no <laughs> You're comment. In the former colonies. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, actually, no, the English and the Americans have become great, great allies and friends. So. I think so. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, wonderful. So, what can we do for you today? Well, I, I had a reflection, quite sure. a powerful reflection whilst you were speaking. And mm -hmm. I was thinking, I do try to live the gospel, but I lack the fervor that you were talking about. And I think as such, although I personally don't believe that all spokes, as you put it, lead to the mm -hmm. one... Um, place I always think it's somebody else's responsibility because I'm not holy enough I mm -hmm. there would be nothing within me that would draw a person and then I, I finally reflected I think if I wait until I'm holy enough I might pass my deathbed you know I'm never going to get there but it had a very powerful impact on me what you said that it's somebody else's responsibility and not mine because I'm not holy enough well here's the question of course you're not holy enough of course you're not None of us is. Read the Gospels and see St. Peter and the Apostles. I mean, we'll die with you. No, you won't, you dopes. You're going to run away. And you, Peter, are going to deny me. And yet, these were the men he had just ordained his first bishops. Now, don't worry about how holy you and I are. 
Because in fact, our own lack of holiness, our own weakness, and our own lack of intelligence sometimes. Now, we don't know everything. We know some stuff, but we don't know everything. We don't always know what to say. We don't know if we're going to have the right answer or something, right? And that's at the, the point at which we say, Lord, you need to be more powerful than I. I can't do it. And um, I don't know what I'm doing. I resonate a lot with St. Peter and the other apostles who are a bunch of, as Mother Angelica used to say in the early days of this network, a bunch of dodos. She always called them dodos. Now, she, some of you don't remember that anymore because she stopped saying it. The older she got and the closer she was to meeting the apostles in heaven, the less she said that. Just saying. She got a lot more nice. But, you know, it, it's, it's more that, you know, all of us, you know, that uh, this is why she also her other famous line was, God uh, expects us to do the ridiculous so he can do the miraculous. And this is something that, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we, we try to, to relate to and say, sure, I'm not. But here's what makes the difference, I, I find, our own prayer life, that we take more time before the Blessed Sacrament in prayer in contemplation of Christ, because that fervor is not getting ourselves hyped up. It's rather the action of Christ and knowing him and loving him. And it's a love for him that eventually Peter and the apostles did go out and transform the world. Secondly, I also think it's extremely important to have a good prayer life that's Marian, praying the rosary, where you meditate on the mysteries of the rosary, which are right out of scripture. These are scriptural. And it draws us into the life of Christ, looking at him through her motherly perspective. Everybody's mom has another perspective, especially on us boys. Moms know what we're up to. We don't get away with much with our moms. Um, that, that's, <laughs> yeah, there's, is that your son? Yeah, you know, saying say, yeah, 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 all of us boys know that. But, you know, the mom's perspective is very important. Same is true with Our Lady. Same is true with Our Lady. And that, you know, gift of prayer will be the source of fervor. Because again, it's the Holy Spirit's action. Okay? I have another caller. Hello, Ray. Ray? Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Um, I'm your stalker from Wrigleyville, Illinois. Mm, you're, that's a, 800 miles away for you to be stalking me. But yes, <laughs> Wrigleyville, by the way, is right uh, is in Chicago. It's a neighborhood right next to Wrigley Field with the uh, wonderful uh, one-time world champion Chicago Cubs. Not often, but they did do it once uh, recently. Uh, that's where they're And we'll do it again this year, Father. Good. I, I'm in favor of it. Um, as a matter of fact, I know the owner, and um, uh, we're all pushing for it. But at any rate, what is your question, Ray? Um, I wanted to ask you about a situation I'm currently in. Um, mm -hmm. A couple members of my family recently lost some close relatives. Mm -hmm. And at the funeral and wake, they were talking about, oh, how could God do this to me, um, taking them and uh, making them suffer and everything? Mm -hmm. And I kind of blurted it out because this is my personal feeling that I said, God does not sit up there with an index card saying, well, John Doe gets a heart attack today, and I'm going to call Mary Jane home and, uh, and give somebody a car crash. I don't believe he's a great dictator in the sky. I don't yeah. believe in God that way. And they were somewhat upset, because I think they were looking for someone to blame. <laughs> and so, maybe I didn't handle it tactfully, but I was just yeah. wanted to get your opinion on it. All right, Ray. A couple things. Um, God is very much part of the issue of people being conceived. I mean, there's, of course, the action of the mother and father, but God is the one who creates the soul and at the moment of death takes it. And 
it's, you know, is very mysterious to me. As someone who has had a very serious heart attack, you know, why sometimes you die and why not? I mean, again, back when I had my heart attack, Father Joseph told all of you, uh, apparently heaven didn't want me and hell was afraid I'd take over. So here I am. So uh, that, that, that a different explanation. But God is the Lord of life and death. And so I would, but here's the other part. Those people have part of their problem because they are too self-centered. And that's something that I would be very strong with them. Who do they think they are? How could God do this to me? This other person is dead, not you. And this is primarily about that person's relationship with God whom they go to meet as their judge at that moment of death. And they will be confronted by God and they will have their own lives laid before them. And it is only secondarily about the other people around you. Now, we do get affected by death. And the death of loved ones is something that you know, very often has caused me great pain. Sometimes a peace and a joy, sometimes great pain, depending on a variety of situations. But it is not, even when it causes me pain, it is not about me when that, that person dies. It's about that person. And then secondarily, it's about their immediate family and then the other levels of relationship in a tertiary way and so on. Um, and that's one of the things they have to keep in mind. Who do they think they are to be making this about themselves? That's one of the things I would say. I might say it a little more gently in their grief. But um, I would say to them, don't make this about you. You pray for the repose of the soul of that person who died. If they've, if they've gone to purgatory, they need your prayers. So, you know, turn the attention away from yourself and keep focused on what God is doing. And more importantly, have yourself ready for when God calls and stop kvetching about what's going on here. Sir, where are you from? I'm from London, England. You know, with this yes, lady well, here. With my mother, yes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Good for you. And your, your uh, question or comment? So my question is, um, well, I work in the youth sector of uh, Westminster Youth Ministry in London. Okay. And so I'm daily sometimes, you know, actively trying to <laughs> spread this message that is for the whole world, specifically to young people. Um, yes. But I find that um, the biggest barrier or challenge isn't so much that, you know, I'm standing here saying this is a message for you and they're not like annoyed about the Christian message. They're indifferent. Mm -hmm. And it's this culture of indifference. I think you touched upon it earlier slightly. Mm -hmm. um, the culture of relativism, all those other buzzwords we have. Like, mm -hmm. and it'd just be really interesting to know. I mean, there's lots been written on it in the new evangelization. But from you as a pastor and minister, mm -hmm. what practical and maybe spiritual advice there is to combat this sure. indifference sure. to this what, global this A lot message. of times the indifference is a stance that people take as a defense. Well, what if this is stupid? I don't want to be dumb. So they'll be indifferent just in case everything looks too dumb. They don't want to make a commitment. And there's a fear of commitment that goes on. And one of my questions would be, what is their family life like? How many of them come from homes, single parent homes, where they are dealing with you know, a lack of, of their parents? Sometimes both parents have not made a commitment to them. And they're afraid to make a commitment to other people, or they don't even know how. You know, in, in this country, I don't know how it is in Great Britain, but in this country, more than 50% of children are born to unmarried parents. The parents won't make a commitment to each other or to their children. How are they supposed to understand that God makes a commitment to them and they can make a commitment back? That takes a certain role of coming to let them experience that commitment. But I'm afraid that I'm real well committed to the end of the show. It's coming to a close. May the Lord bless you all and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
And uh, again, as Mother Angelica set it up, as one of her other things, keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so we can pay our bills. Remember, this network is brought to you by you. We don't do advertising and such. It's you who make it possible to reach to the world. God bless you and thank you for your support.